Today, from Havana meets at the Cultural Center in 31 and 2 streets in Havana to talk to Dairamir Gonzalez, a young pianist, teacher, composer, band leader, working out his way in the jazz world. He nourishes from the Afro-Cuban legacy and innovates with many other rhythms. An artist who has conquered an important place inside world music, always defending his Cuban roots. Well, Dairamir, welcome to From Havana. Thank you for meeting us today. It's a pleasure for us to, to have you in the program. Thank you. You are from Cerro in Havana, uh, a very popular uh, neighborhood of Havana. You come from a very humble family and your education took place in a kind of complex moment for Cuba because it was uh, starting the special period in the 1990s. And all this process when you were educating uh, during all, uh, all these years, but in a point during those years of preparation and formation, uh, somehow you arrived to New York. That's why, because of all those things that took you uh, uh, to New York, that's why you, you said that your life is, is a grand concourse? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, that's correct. I grew up in El Cerro in 1990s where, you know, it was a very tough period, you know, because we used to have 12 hours of no electricity in Cuba. You know, you have to really program yourself to get water, you know, and it was very hot in Cuba, as we know. But, uh, but uh, you know, I always say that um, I grew up in a family with a lot of love, and I grew up in a family where I had the piano right there next to me, and a very musical environment wa wa was very uh, amazing for me to grow up listening to my mom singing, my grandma singing, my, my, my father playing the trumpet. So every, every Sunday, my father used to ring to my, my living room, the, his friends, so I used to play the piano for, the, for him, going to the, to, the, to the kitchen, having my tulsito, come back and then for a lot of you, Dairamir Gonzalez, coming to the, do my bow and play the piano for them. So in somehow, it was that encouragement to see music, not like I'm going to spend eight hours playing. So it was like a, a very easy transition for me to, to, to practice, you know, and, and become a professional. I, I did my elementary school of music, and then I did my, my as a teenager, I did La Hena, uh, and then I go to, to the U.S. in 2010, thanks to an opportunity, an amazing opportunity, that I was awarded with a presidential scholarship at Berkeley College of Music. So I go to the U.S. in Boston in 2010. 2013, after graduating, I decided to stay a little longer season in New York City. <laughs> The Grand Congress because I moved to the to to the South Bronx, the South Bronx, and uh, you know I saw like a a, a, a parallel a way of, of comparing El Cerro with the South Bronx in New York, and I felt that it was kind of a similar environment, and I decided that you know the Grand Concourse was going to be the most suitable uh, name to portray my music to create the platform for people to see my music right there. During your uh educational, your music formation here in Cuba, you took the opportunity to share uh, scenarios with important Cuban artists, Cuban pianists, such as Chucho Valdez. Mm. Uh, how would you describe the influence of those artists in your career? Chucho Valdez, for, you know, without any doubt, he was the biggest paradigm that I had as a, as a, as a pianist. When I was growing up, my dad introduced me to Chucho Valdez and Iraquere, and I got completely amazed by the way Chucho Valdez used to accompany, you know, piano solo or mara por tuondo, having such a big dynamic range of, of a, music, a social musician. So I always saw Chucho Valdez as, as the biggest example for me to follow. So and then, growing up in 2008, I had the, it was at seven, I had the opportunity to perform first time with Chucho and Beo Valdez in La Plaza de Toro de Zaragoza. And uh, 2008, he invited me to open the Havana Jazz Festival, solo piano with him, Harold Lopez Nusa, Rolando Luna. And then 2010, he prepared me, he heard this, the composition that I was going to play for, for, for Berkeley, and, uh, you know, continue. And, uh, you know, Chucho Valdez have always been someone that I admire, you know, so much. 
as we were saying, now you live in New York. Mm -hmm. How is that experience to present in different uh, scenarios outside of Cuba, such as Carnegie Hall? Uh, imagine that uh, one day I'm sitting in my, in my room while, while studying at Berkeley, and then I received the email from Chucho Valdez saying, Chucho Valdez organizing voices from Latin America at Carnegie Hall. So he's going to present five of the top pianists representing different generations of, of Latin American pianists. Then Edbeto Gismonti, Brazil, Danilo Perez, Panama, Gonzalo Rubalcaba, Chucho, Chucho Valdez, and Dairamil Gonzalez. Such a big honor. While studying at Berkeley, 2010, November 12, 2012, coming to New York City, seeing my face in a big poster in, in, in Carnegie Hall sold out. The next day, the Wall Street Journal putting a big face of Chucho and I saying Cuban sport filled the hall. Such a great honor. I was really living what they say, the American dream. <laughs> <laughs> It was my own dream of being a Carnegie Hall invited by Chucho Valdez, one of my biggest heroes, definitely. Wow. How do you make that your name comes out and how do you earn a space in that such complex world that is music, but especially the world of jazz? Yeah, it is a very tricky uh, uh, genre because it's, it's, so, it's very niche. You know, jazz music is, is so it's it kind of so, so philosophical and somehow that uh, the market is very niche. But uh, there is always a big audience for it, uh, ready for it. And uh, what I did is that I, I found myself being conscious of, of visualizing who was Dairamir Gonzalez in comparison with my other Cuban pianists of my generation. Who was Dairamir Gonzalez in comparison with the other American pianists of my generation. What made me different? What made me especially unique? So I was able to embrace what made me unique and create my voice. So that, that, that made me, you know, who I am today, you know, because I, I really made my voice stronger to, to be able to, you know, differentiate, be, be, being different from the other ones. How was that um, transit you made uh, from, from Havana to New York? How, how was that line? You were preparing here, uh -huh. you were studying, and then you got to New York. How do you did it? Okay, I, I was into, you know, in 2007, we need to go back to 2007. 2007, I did, I made a tour in Spain with Chucho Valdez, Diego El Cigala, and Beo Valdez. I performed in La Plaza de Toro de Zaragoza for 15,000 people. So that performance really opened the door for me to be signed with a performing right organization that is called SGAE, S-G-A-E. Uh, SGAE in Madrid performing right organization, so they decided in 2009 to open to, uh, they were awarding one, one million dollars to support seven presidential scholarship for SGAE members. So me and many other uh, Cubans decide to, you know, to do the audition in Mexico City to, to apply for Berkeley, and I found out that uh, I was the only Cuban accepted such a great honor going to Berkeley College of Music, especially because I had all my musical heroes, Joe Lovano, Aaron Goldberg, eh, Dave Liebman, Bowie Manferrin, I don't know, Pat Matheny, Bram Meldau, all of those amazing heroes that I was listening in my iPad. All of the students, they were walking around the school. They were teaching, they teaching classes for me in, 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 a, in, in a classroom. So it was very, like, wow, this is like the la la land <laughs> <laughs> for me. So I spent three years at Berkeley. Uh, and then after I graduated in 2013, I decided to, you know, to spend a little more, a longer season in New York City because I believe that New York was the perfect scenario for me, the perfect, the perfect city to, to push the, the jazz music that I, that I had in, in, you know, in my, in my, in my, in my, in my, my human center. You were born and raised in a, in a country uh, that has been uh, for some years, for almost 60 years, politically um, uh, assediated. How music breaks those political tensions between Cuba and the United States? I want to say that um, the conversation was broken 1959 and 1960s when the Cuban Revolution took part and then in somehow uh, the Americans, uh, the United States didn't really 
embrace the Cuban Revolution. So Fidel Castro got isolated with, the, with, with his, his uh, vision of portraying his, his revolution. So for many, in many ways, Cuba got isolated from the world, but uh, musical-wise, we started to develop a very strong voice with La Nueva Trova, uh, Pablo Milanes, Silvio Rodriguez, Los Bamban, and many different types of genres that were created in Cuba. And somehow, uh, the world wasn't, be, wasn't able to really see what was happening in Cuba musical-wise for a long, long period of time. 1990s, vino el boom de la timba, Cuban timba. So and somehow, La Charanga Banera, Bam Bam, and La Banda, El Medico de la Salsa created a movement in Cuba that I were creating like, a, okay, this is not salsa anymore. This is something even beyond salsa. It's like a stronger timba. So I would say that uh, the Cuba is starting to send for a long while a message that uh, through music, through art, we need to find a way to create the conversation, to, to start creating the conversation between the two countries. I think that uh, music has always been a, a, an amazing way of, of sending messages. It can be political, it can be social, but uh, you know, we Cuban have been always open, have been always open to demonstrate the best of what we can portray to the world. So it's just like, it's, it was a matter of time that uh, those conversation got reestablished again to finally, because actually, in my opinion, the ones who suffered were the, the American people, because they always wanted to come back to Cuba to experience Cuba firsthand. And the Cuban people, because we have been always musical wise, bebop and music, bebop and Cuban music, Chano Pozo, DC Gillespie, Celia Cruz, Machito, eh, eh, and Chucho Valdez with Chico Farrell. So many musicians, Americans and Cubans, that have been able to, for a long while, creating so much, such amazing music, and the conversation was broken. So now is the time to continue finding the way to get us together again. You are a Cuban that lived there in the United States. Tell us what have you seen, uh, in what measure the U.S. Uh, economical, financial uh, blockade that they imposed to Cuba affect both sides? Well, from the Cuban perspective, definitely it's very easy to see that uh, Cuba has been in somehow lacking a lot of economical things that uh, we said that uh, the one who has suffered the most are us, the Cuban people. You know, we have been able to, you know, we haven't been able to have access to a lot of uh, basic needs that are somehow, you know, ha it's important to continue, you know, a, 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 you know, for for you know the survival thing that we have in Cuba. But I think that uh, um, I want I want to say that uh, Cubans we are we are resilient. We are resilient. You know, this is a a, a, an, a characteristic that we have that have been able to for us to continue moving along among these years and being able to I don't know how. But I continue to, you know, not only to survive, but also to have amazing pianists, composers, a, a videographer, artists, a, a people from from a, a professional from from the sport, you know, the ballet, everywhere, you know. So we are mis we we are, we are individuals that are, we have been able to find a way to, you know, doesn't matter how many economic things you are lacking, we find a way to know, to get it around and portray the best of us and continue supporting the best of Cuba in many ways, in many ways. One of the things that have uh, make it odd, have, that, that have made odd the relations between Cuba and the United States recently are the, these accusations of, uh, of a supposed uh, acoustic attacks mm -hmm. that occurred here in Cuba to U.S. diplomats. What do you think that happened? <laughs> uh, have they heard the right music? Uh, do they <laughs> like Cuban music? <laughs> well, uh, probably the, the acoustic uh, sonic problem was like uh, you have a, a big reggaeton car open, you know, in, in an open car and, and it was too loud that they go, you know. I mean, it, it have not been proven, you know. In my perspective, for what I have heard, I have been reading about it, 
uh, it has been proven of any any attack. I, I don't really believe that um, you know the Cuban government will have any part in in embracing any any attack, especially if you having people that you are uh, you know from the embassy that you're having here that you're hosting here. I think it's insane to to believe that Cuba will be able to to support such a, a accusations. Uh, in my opinion, I think that um, that uh, uh <laughs> it has been proven. So this is what I want to say that uh, probably uh, this is something that uh, the conversation continue. I think that um, that uh, I use uh, an, an excuse to find a way to to you know to start up again the conversation in the wrong way. You know, because the Cubans who live in Cuba, the Cubans who live in the U.S. The Americans who year by year come to, to Cuba, the Americans who live in the U.S. that are love Cuba, for a long while we have been dreaming to have this amazing relationship that, uh, that uh, for the last five, six, seven years starting to, to warm up again. So I believe that, uh, that you know, I think it's insane to, you know, to find a way to find excuses to to go back to make a call again when you know when everybody has been able to you know to get a, you know take advantage of, of the amazing thing that uh, Cuba and the United States the, the Cuban people the people of Cuba and the people of the United States have been able to again come back and without any fear to travel freely to Cuba to experience Cuba firsthand Cuban musicians going to the U.S. experience the music there uh, Americans in Cuba to be able to, you know, to, 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 to see Cuba from the Cuban perspective. So I think that uh, we, should, we should continue to embrace that, no, not the other way around, not the other way around. Recently, Cuba's President Miguel Díaz-Canel was um, in fact saying to Telesur, he was saying uh, that there, in fact there was a rollback in relation to the relation between Cuba and the United States. How music and, and you as, an, as a musician, as an artist, how music can, can uh, do its part in, in, that, uh, in that process of stopping that rollback of relation? Um, it's, it is unfortunate. It is unfortunate uh, because me living in the U.S., there's a lot of Americans who now have certain fear to come to Cuba because of the sonic attack, there is a lot of media propaganda telling Americans, if you go, if you go to Cuba, be careful, because such and such and such can happen. And nothing further from the reality. You know, if you come to Cuba, it's probably, probably, at, at least, at least, no, I would say that it's probably one of the safest places to be, okay? And especially, we, the Cuban people, take care a lot the, the, the foreign people to come to here. We embrace the people here to make them feel as welcome as possible. So for me, uh, I think that uh, it's, a, it's a fear that they are implementing in, you know, in, in the Cuban, Cubans and the Americans who want to come to Cuba and they have right now certain fears that uh, you know, it, shouldn't, it, shouldn't be, it shouldn't happen. And actually, well, uh, now we have more restrictions happening, you know, the, uh, you know, President Donald Trump, they, you know, what he, uh, you know, believes that uh, Cuba should, should do something with their human rights. Okay, I mean, those are conversations that are, are not part of my, you know, I'm not a professional in this, I don't really want to get deeply in this, but, um, no one should tell Cuba how to manage their own country. This is this is the way I see it. That's my 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 perspective. This is my 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 opinion. You know, every country had the way to manage the balance and what they believe that is right for the people. So, Cuba uh, is a country that um, embraces education. Of course, human, human rights, of course. It's a country where, where every time I bring my son here, he feels very, very free 
and I don't have any worry at all to, to, for him to, to, you know, to walk around, to, to be around. So what I want to say that I always said to the American people, come to Cuba and experience Cuba firsthand and uh, you will see that uh, unfortunately most of what, what the media in the U.S. is sending sometimes is, is not as accurate as it should. You know. So you come back to Cuba frequently and in some way you uh, pay back the education you received yeah. here. So how is that Dairamir, Dairamir the teacher, Mm -hmm. The educator. The educator. Yeah. How is him? Who is him? I, I mean, I, I, it's very natural in me to be able to, to sit down and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and educate and, and teach and pass the knowledge that I've been learning. For many years, I, I have seen myself that I, I was a teenager, that I wanted to be a leader of my own project. So when I was playing with Clima, Girardo Piloto and Clima or, or, or Diacara, I always try to see in my leaders how, as a leader, they used to manage people's uh, relationship. So how they were able as a leader to, to, to be able to manage certain uh, uh, things in, 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 the, in, the daily, in the daily in the daily life. So I was trying to acquire all of those uh, uh, characteristics in my own thing. So as an educator, when I go to the U.S., I was able to, to embrace more and work more with it. Now I have 260 students in the South Bronx where I have a, a very a strong music curriculum where, where basically what I do is to present a, you know, a very a strong legacy of what, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I learned when I was in Cuba and pass it to the, to the, to the American uh, teenagers today. So basically, just to be to be very conscious of how many hours you should you should uh, uh, practice, how you should you know how you should uh, uh, study certain certain uh, things. Same way when I come back to to Cuba, I believe that I, I have been acquiring a lot of knowledge for a long while in my career, and I believe that I had to I had the responsibility to give back to my 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 students in here everything they have learned. Just recently, I did a couple of master classes in, 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 you know, in Cuba here, and it was, you know, it was so fulfilling for me to see how, what was the joy for of the student to see, man, you know, the music harmony, New Yorker harmony, how, how he approaches, you know, a bebop music, but also how to arrange for a string quartet for five and six voices. So it was amazing for them to, you know, to, to see that as someone is coming, taking their time, to come to the school and, and, and teach them in first hand my own experience musical wise. As a music stu a student that you were and now as a teacher, which would you say is the secret of the artistic education in Cuba? Is it because Cubans have many, much um, talent or because the Cuban education is out of this, uh, uh -huh. this planet <laughs> or both? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, first of all, is that, uh, that uh, we have created very uh, strong uh, schools in different neighborhoods that uh, every time you see that your kid is talented enough, you do, you do an audition to get to that. And then it's li like the whole institutions of, of music education are very well placed. So it's, you, know, you go from elementary school of music to high school and then to college. So you have someone that is, is really taking you from the hand, taking the kid from the hand, and in introducing them to music appreciation, to Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, listening, critical listening. The same with a uh, solfege, ear training, piano, composition. So somehow you have a very broad student from seven years old all the way to 20. So when you graduated, you have a such a strong platform already created that you are ready, you know, to go to, you know, to go out there. I really want to say that now that I've been coming more often to do master classes, I think that also, you know, that the Cuban Cuban school should be able to, to, you know, to develop a little more the popular side because there is a lot of students who, you know, they love writing for 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 salsa, for jazz, for for you know, for a lot of different type of popular genres. And today we don't have yet 
in, in elementary and high school of music in Cuba yet. We don't have like a strong popular uh, uh, curriculum for those students who have the inclination for, for that. That's why every time I come, I try to, you know, to do more with it. You know, they, they really want to learn how, you know, how to grab follow from band, how to do for that. So it will, it, you know, it will be great if we continue, you know, improving, improving that sense in the popular size. For a while, you've been taking forward this project of the Art School of Contemporary Performance and Creativity, <laughs> uh, an educative, uh, educative program mm -hmm. in South Bronx. Why to work on children education uh, formation in music? Uh, is that how you see your future? Well, I'm defi I definitely see my future in many different ways. One of those is education. For me, for me, my opinion, education is the way that we place skills and tools to the new generation to continue pushing the future in music. You know, what I want is to make in the, uh, students in Cuba and the world that are self-sufficient. Self-sufficient is that I, I'm going to give you the skills for you to, to understand how Mozart used to write music. But I don't want you to write a song, the same song that Mozart did. I want you to create your own music, the own, your own Mozart song, okay? The same with Miles Davis, with John Coltrane, with uh, Juan Formel, with Elito Rebe, okay? So I'm going to give you the tools for you to be self-sufficient and, and be a creative in your own. So for me, one, one of the paths that I see myself, uh, you know, pianist, composer, also educator, film scorer, you know, but education has a lot of, like a very strong uh, part of myself. I, have, I feel that responsibility with the world. How do you conceive those roots that always take you back? Family is the biggest love that, uh, you know, for me, move me anywhere I go, uh, my family here in Havana, in Cuba. Second one is that sense of responsibility for social and cultural to bring back to my people in Cuba everything that I have learned through my years of career. And uh, music is my way of portraying scene, portraying things. So I believe that, uh, that uh, Cuba is my place. You know, I'm a Cuban pianist who is based in New York. When I tour the world, they present me as Dairamir Gonzalez, Cuban pianist and composer. So for me, Cuba is my, my face, is who I am. So that's why coming back to Cuba is just researching my batteries, is my soul, you know, to come back to my root, who I am, and then to come back and continue shining and bringing back everything that I know from, from Cuba abroad. Well, Diarmir, thank you very much <laughs> for meeting us. I hope that we can get in touch again soon. Of course. I wish you good success. Thank you. And we'll meet again.